Good afternoon everybody and hopefully there's some children and some dogs watching as well. This is Debbie Evans and this is Rolo, my time travelling Jack Russell and today we're going back to book three, The Secret Adventures of Rolo, The Dragon's Pram and this first chapter of the book is all about the building of the Kennet and Avon Canal. So, without further ado, off we go. I love the Kennet and Avon Canal. Brightly coloured barges chug up and down the 87 mile waterway and I think it would be a lovely peaceful way to travel. The smiley lady and floppy haired boy often take me for walks along the towpaths at Hungerford, Bradford on Avon and Honey Street, but my favourite stretch of all is the Cane Hill Locks at Devizes. Athelstan sent Yulia and Bubo the Owl to tell me he had a very important mission for me involving the canal. For this adventure, I would need to travel to the neighbouring market town of Devizes, where I had met the shy horses and found out about Moonrakers on previous adventures. The Guardian Dragon gave me the lowdown on the 200-year-old canal. Work had commenced on the waterway in 1794 from both ends, from Bradford-on-Avon west to Bath, Bristol and east to Devizes and from Newbury to Reading. The Kennis and Avon Canal was an ambitious project, originally planned to follow the natural contours of the land. I asked Athelstan how the canals were actually built, as it seemed a massive engineering project to me. Dug out by hand, little pup. Canal builders in the 18th and 19th centuries were called cutters because they literally had to cut a channel through the ground. The term navigators was adopted and from this the more familiar navvies stuck. These were casual workers made up from farmhands, ex-miners and quarrymen, Athelstan explained. The trickiest part of this particular canal, and the last stretch to be constructed, was the dilemma of Cane Hill in Devizes, a short, sharp hill. The problem had been temporarily overcome by a horse-drawn rail track, but this was not ideal because the cargo had to be unloaded from the barges, then horse-drawn up the hill and then reloaded onto barges at the top. The dramatic height of the land meant a stairway of 16 locks had to be built very close to each other with the use of side ponds to refill each lock after use, the brainchild of engineer John Rennie. This staircase forms part of the 29 lock flight at Devizes, which spans nearly two miles. It was to this spot that Athelstan wanted to send me. So this is how I came to find myself on Cane Hill, where the steep flight of locks and ponds were under construction. It was 1810. That's the year, not the time. I watched for a while as physically strong, bare-chested men wielded their combined muscle power to heave, pick and shovel. It seemed to me the job entailed much digging and removal of surplus earth by means of nothing fancier than a wooden wheelbarrow. It looked like tough and dangerous work with very basic tools and, listening to the men grumbling, they received very little pay for their efforts. Redrawing some of the plans after the work had commenced meant escalating costs. Some hills needed tunnelling through because the ground was not all soft clay as originally thought and rock had to be blasted with gunpowder. I watched a pair of navvies larking about whilst emptying dug mud from their wooden wheelbarrow. They started flinging it about and a few others joined in. I frowned, thinking, this won't get the job finished. I looked about, but there didn't seem to be anyone in charge and no one was supervising this stage of the construction. Health and safety rules seemed non-existent in the early 19th century. I thought there was supposed to be an overseer from the canal company on site, but these men had been left to their own devices. I strolled up to the top lock to see how progress was going. Perhaps I could be the foreman. I fancied myself as project manager. I sat on the bank and watched several men climb down into the deep channel to test the lining to see if this last lock was dry. 
they were balancing rather precariously on wooden planks suspended over the canal bed so as not to damage the newly laid lining. I remembered Athelstan had told me that the lining was made from a mixture of local clay and loam known as puddle clay. The navvies had to get this bit right or the channel would simply not be watertight. On the side of the channel, two men were sorting big stones and marking them for their, with their special mason mark. This local stone for constructing the sides of the canal came from the quarry downriver at Bathampton. One of the navvies, a big brawny man, suddenly glanced up and shouted at me to clear off. I suppose they didn't want me leaving any paw prints on their handiwork. I scampered out of range of the stones he was sending my way. I ran along the bank of the canal, the part that would eventually become the towpath, so-called because the first barges were horse-drawn and therefore towed, as they had no engine. To my surprise, in the next lock, down the flight, where the puddle clay lining was almost set hard, a herd of cattle was being encouraged to go down a ramp. I couldn't figure out the purpose of this, but then thought it was probably to help flatten the base and really pack it down tightly. The cows were reluctant to go down the ramp and the navvies didn't seem to know much about cow herding. I sat and watched this entertainment for a while. There was no way these cows were going down the ramp. Surveying the scene, I wondered why Athelstan had sent me here and then I heard a slight creak. Well, it started as more of a groan than a creak and I ran to the top overflow pond where I thought the sound was coming from. The creak got louder and was followed by an ominous rumble. I could see what was happening. The weight of the water was going to force open the lock gate and the men investigating the lining had no way of getting out once that volume of water started gushing in. Let me just show you. Chantal's drawing there. I had to act quickly. Not you again, get away, shouted the man with tattoos on his muscular arms as he looked up and scowled at me from the bottom of the lock. I started yapping and barking more and more insistently, jumping round in circles. I had to get them to realise the danger they were in, but this wasn't working. I started yapping and barking more and more insistently. I looked around frantically, desperate for a way to attract their attention, and spied a lunch pack tied up with string lying beside the towpath. I snatched it up and started running. That did the trick. No worker would want his lunch running away. The men started to climb the steel rung ladder up the sheer stone wall of the canal in pursuit of their stolen food. Their shouts masked the creaks of the straining lock. As the last navvy had his foot on the bottom rung, the sluice gate could no longer hold back the force of goodness knows how many gallons of water and the dam burst open. The water level started to rise rapidly right to the top of the canal, a moment longer on the bottom of the dry lock and they would have all drowned. I held my breath as the last man managed to stay one rung ahead of the water. All the men were now safely on the towpath and couldn't believe their lucky escape. No one had even got their boots wet. Thank goodness the cows in the next lock had refused to go down the ramp or they would have perished in the mass of water which was taking no prisoners as it flooded down the new flight of locks. I was rewarded with a hunk of bread and ham from the lunch pack I'd stolen which I wolfed down in seconds and then succumbed to a lot of rough petting. The big man crouched down and ruffled my ears as he called me Boyo. He must have been from my native Wales. Sharing their lunch and looking at the canal construction, I had an idea which I needed to share with them so that they would hopefully never be in this kind of dangerous situation again. For some reason, I couldn't communicate with these men like I can with some humans when I time travel. Instead, I had to demonstrate my idea. I went over to a plank of wood and nudged it over onto its side, leaning it against two big stones for support. What's that daft mutt doing? queried one of the navvies. They all watched, baffled. Ah, I get it, you clever dog, said the Welshman. 
We cut slots, see, in the sides of the feeder locks, so if ever we need to stop the water flow to inspect or make repairs, we can slide a plank of wood in and temporarily isolate the lock which needs repair. The men agreed this was a brilliant idea. That would be mine then. I learned from Athelstan later that the success of the Kennis and Avon Canal was short-lived because of the coming of the railway to the region. In 1852, just 40 years later, the great engineer Isambard Kingdom Brunel's Great Western Railway Company bought up the canal company very cheaply and soon railway replaced waterway as it was a more efficient way of transportation for goods. For now, my mission was complete and I went home with tail wagging, pleased about the lives I had saved. I will always have a wry smile on my furry face when I walk along the Kennis and Avon Canal with my people in future. I wonder if they will notice the slots for the planks by the lock gates. My idea. Back to my basket with a full tummy and the luxury of sleep. So that's the end of that chapter, but I would just like to share with you one of Rolo's dog blogs. These run throughout his series in between the adventure chapters, and these are things that happen in his everyday life as a lovable pet. The smiley lady likes a general knowledge crossword in Saturday's newspaper because she says it keeps her mind active. She'd gone to church on Sunday morning and I thought I would have a look at yesterday's crossword puzzle and see if she needed any help. I jumped up on the dining room table. <laughs> Rolo's chasing his tail here and joining in. With the aid of a chair that hadn't been pushed in properly, this was daring stuff as I knew jolly well I wasn't allowed up there. She seemed to be stuck on a few though. Let's see, three down female swan. She'd written in cob and then tried to rub it out. I knew the correct answer was pen, but where had she put her pen? I couldn't find anything to write the answer with. I heard the key turn in the front door lock and froze to the spot as the door opened and she had almost caught up with me on the table doing her crossword puzzle. To create a diversion, I picked up her reading glasses and jumped down running towards her, carrying them gently in my mouth. Oh, Rolo, what on earth are you doing with my glasses? Have you been trying to finish my crossword? Rolo's just coming back to join us. <laughs> she tried to sound cross with me about being on the table, but I couldn't, but I could tell that she secretly found it funny. In the end, I saw her looking up the answer to three down, and I must just share with you the drawing of Rolo doing the crossword. And yes, he really did jump down off the dining room table and bring me my glasses. So I'm sure he was trying to finish off the crossword. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Rolo was a little bit woofy there. We'll be back again tomorrow at 3.30. So please join us with a cup of tea, children, grandchildren, pets, anybody who'd like to listen. And we'll be back with another chapter from the secret adventures of Rolo. Thank you. Goodbye.